Hello, I'm Kurt, and welcome to another episode of the Fish Duck One-on-One Video Podcast, where each week I sit down to speak with a former student athlete, outside experts, and occasionally some of our own writers to kind of you know talk a little about a little bit about duck sports. This week I went back to the 1970s to talk with Keith Gunther. He was an offensive lineman at Oregon from 1973 through 1977. Later was a high school football coach. And two of his sons, Kyle and Curtis, played Division I football as well, offensive linemen for Utah and San Diego State. So there's been all these great individual talents, even when overall the team wasn't competitive with the top tier of, of the league. And certainly your era, there was Brian Hinkle and Fred Quillen and George Martin, Mario Clark, Vince Goldsmith, Reggie Grant, all these guys that ended up in the NFL from the yeah. 70s. And, you know, when people look back on Oregon history, usually they think, you know, Dan Fouts and Ahmad Rashad, 69 through 71, and then they skip forward <laughs> a, a while to either Reggie Ogburn era, 79, 80, or they go straight to like Bill Musgrave. Absolutely. It was, it was a different time. And, and, uh, you know, coming in in, in 1973, we, we of course didn't have uh, Ahmad Rashad or, or Dan Fouts, but we had a whole host of players that were holdovers from that Jerry Fry era. I had a chance to go to UCLA, and that was the first year of the scholarship limit. And so he came down in, in I think, uh, March and uh, saw me in, in, on some film, back then they had film, and, and said, okay, you know, he offered me a scholarship on the spot. And I said, well, sure. And then I went down and met Tim Stokes and John Marshall and Coach Marshall wasn't all that enthusiastic about me. He was just like, well, Keith, you know, we got a lot of linemen here and, and, and you're 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 not that big, you're only about 230, 240, and, and you know, I just don't know if this is the right place for you. And I had the choice between San Jose State and Air Force Academy and uh, a couple other schools and, and, and walk on gray shirt kind of a thing at UCLA and, and I said, No, coach, I'm coming here. I took one look at Opson and and at that 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 lemon and green uniforms and, and said this is for me. I look at them more as, as just signs of the times or maybe coaching decisions. The athletes were there. Now granted we weren't making you know 50 bucks a game or 40 bucks a game like they were at USC and UCLA at the time which was a lot of money back then uh, and we didn't have the treatment but I think we they definitely had the, the horses there. I mean these guys you go in the weight room and you look on the walls and you'd see you know Graham and Drugus and all these famous uh, ducks up on the wall and it would inspire you to, to want to pump iron and and that's when we started that program you know the great thing about the Oregon program and, and what it's come to and I know you've seen this Kurt is that they brought the players back together right yeah that, that, that Rose Bowl three years ago the Rose Bowl in the mid 90s we got to see guys we hadn't seen in 10 15 years and, and this last Rose Bowl on there and, and, and uh, Bob Donnelly walks up to me and he, he puts his finger on my nose and pulls it down and he goes hey not bad <laughs> There were no snubbers back then. <laughs> you look at that helmet behind you, that might have a snubber across the nose piece. Oh, yeah. Well, see, when we played, they didn't have those. It was just the, the hard helmet right there. Yep. It come down and hit you right on the bridge of the nose. So we all had our noses ripped open, blood all over the place. Probably broke mine twice. <laughs> and so that's the first thing the equipment manager did is whenever he sees us from the 70s, he grabs our nose and goes, yeah, how's it looking? And so we had these guys like George Martin played 16 years in the NFL and, and has the all-time NFL record for fumble returns for touchdowns and, and Reggie Lewis, you know, the guy probably ran a 4840 was was 62 2, 245 250 and and we couldn't hit we couldn't hit these guys. We had to block them and, and it was tough in practice. Uh, really taught us a lot and and I think the thing Marshall liked to do was uh, do a lot of live contact drills during practice as well, which was unique for the time where we go one on one. Mhm. Of course, offensive linemen always have a disadvantage going one on one because the defensive lineman knows what's going on. Right, <laughs> surprises there, and uh, so so we we uh, we cut our teeth hitting these guys that are that are NFLers today. Bobby Green, famous linebacker, and and, and this was just in '73 and '74. I hadn't even gotten to the later '70s. There yet. were so many great players that came from that era individually that did go go on to success, but. The one name that stands out to people actually never played in the NFL. He played for years in the CFL. And as a defensive lineman, you had to go up against him a lot. The the guy that always stands out from this era, Vince Goldsmith. Mm -hmm. Tell me about having to practice against Vince Goldsmith. Well, I was actually uh, kicked out of practice because of Vince Goldsmith. <laughs> he was he was a younger player. He was a 77 he came in. Was an all American shot putter and and he was like five ten, five eleven, but the guy was like two hundred and sixty pounds of solid muscle. I think he played ten years in the Canadian League. Yep. 
It's just a frightening looking human being. And uh, of course, started as a freshman, and, and here I was, I think, a, a redshirt junior uh, after the two knee surgeries. And we're at practice one day, and we're in, in helmets and, and shoulder pads and shorts, and we're walking through. And so I'm out there, and I'm, I'm playing guard, I think, and, and Vince comes in, and, and we're not supposed to hit these guys. Well, what does Vince do? Vince gives me a forearm, <laughs> shoves me about two feet over. So I go, okay, okay. So, so it's the like that then. <laughs> So the next play, I put my helmet right in his arm and uh, gave him a pop. And the coaches just sprinted over and tore me out of there and <laughs> threw me on the sideline. I didn't know who this guy was. Right. You know, we were just going back and forth. And you, I can guarantee you, he didn't feel what I did to him at all. By that third year with Reed, you know, things were, were getting tough. I think we had Jack Henderson, at quarterback, and Norv had moved on. And, and uh, you know, it, it was it was just a lot of competition out there that caused that team, those teams not to be as good as they could. But... In 76, I think we were four and five. You know, I, I think we'd done okay. And of course, we beat Oregon State every year, but my freshman year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was four years in a row. So, you know, we did a lot of good things with Don Reed. And uh, I had my second knee surgery that uh, spring, uh, or that, that winter, rather. I missed that season. And uh, the coaches were fired unceremoniously in December. All of them. John Marshall, Reed, the whole group. And uh, they brought in uh, this guy, Rich Brooks. From Oregon State, of all places. Well, I think he had come from UCLA directly, but yeah, from Oregon State before that. And so Rich Brooks shows up, and he's a former drill sergeant. And uh, I go to register for my spring classes in 1977, and uh, or I guess, yeah, 77, and I had no scholarship. They had cut my scholarship when they had left, and I had had two knee surgeries and supposed to have a fifth year of eligibility. And even though I couldn't play, at least a couple terms of scholarship. So I was... Heartbroken, but I, I, I kept going to the, the uh, Oxen and lifting weights. And, and then one day, about a week or two later, Rich Brooks calls me on the phone, which back then was a big deal to call you on the phone at home. There are no answering machines. And right. I picked up the phone. He says, Keith, this is Rich Brooks. He said, uh, do you still want to play? I said, well, you know, the doctors say with two knee surgeries, I can't play anymore. He says, well, I talked to the doctors. You can play. He says, do you want your scholarship back? I said, yeah. <laughs> yes, I do, Coach Brooks. And so he brought me into his office and, and looked me in the eye. We kind of cried together a little bit as we, we talked about what it's like to be a duck. And, and here he just gotten there. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, you know, you're, you're going to have younger guys that are maybe not as good as you. They're going to play in front of you. You're going to have situations you might not be happy with what I do. But if you want to play on this team, you know, I'll give you a shot. And so he never sugarcoated it. And, and I ended up traveling that year and, and playing in most of the games and, and uh, having a great season. And that really recovered my whole career at Oregon. And it was because... Rich Brooks had the forethought to say, here's a veteran, here's a guy that's been around, he'll work hard, let's bring him in. I have the ultimate respect for him, and I've told him this story several times over the last 20 years, because I'm sure he doesn't remember. Uh, but, but that, to me, is just what Oregon football is about. It's, it's giving somebody a shot, giving them a chance. And, and, of course, that year we played Georgia and LSU and, and uh, TCU. TCU and, and, yeah, that's when I think Oregon football got its glimpse of growing up. With, with that Rich Brooks's first year, and you were talking about with Reggie Ogburn and, and the 80, 81, 82, mm -hmm. you know, that, that it's true. You got this gap between uh, Jerry Fry and, and Dan Fouts and, and, and that Ogburn era, but but people have to remember that, that that's what Rich Brooks did in a very short period of time. He built that program. So here you've got Rich Brooks, Mike Bellotti, Niels Mbukas, Bill Taro, Steve Great, you know, parts of this program for 30 years, 25 years. That, right. To us, when we come back, you know, 30 years later, it's just an amazing statistic to think these guys go back to when we played. And it's really fascinating, too, particularly in the era that you played, 73 through 77, because you ended up playing for three different head coaches, three different regimes. When you came in, it was Dick Enright, then it was Don Reed, and then for your senior year, Rich Brooks comes in. You know, how difficult was it to adjust to three different coaches and three different systems as you were going through your career? Well, you know, I, I think... You approach it like anything else. You approach it with with 100% commitment to learning their system and 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 being you know being part of that program and, and learning what it takes to please that particular coach. The tough part comes is that you have to prove yourself every year. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got the same coaches and the same staff and and you know they're they're going to play certain. So maybe I guess the thing I can say is through all those three coaches in those five years was it was just always tough. It doesn't matter whether it was Marshall, McRae, or 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 Taro. I mean, it, it was just. It was a tough time, a lot of a lot of live hitting. 
Oregon football has never been easy. The other interesting aspect of the coaching changes was that when you look back on the teams, it looked like things were steadily improving under Don Reed. The team had gone from two and nine and two and nine and seventy three and seventy four to three and eight and then four and seven in nineteen seventy six. It looked like there was a a steady improvement taking place. And then the seventy seven season comes in, Rich Brooks, and it's a step backwards the team only ends up going two and nine there were wins over tcu and oregon state that was it was that a little bit weird seeing that there was progress taking place with the program you were steadily increasing wins per year and the coaches shown the door yeah it was a shock uh and like i said I, I was also part of that that group having lost my scholarship and and the whole thing was was very disappointing and and that was part of that that deal with a lot of guys leaving the program players is i, I think it gave them a very bitter feeling and and they didn't like how things work, but you know that's life. It teaches you a lot about life. And you know what Rich Brooks did is is he came in, and he would get us up at five thirty in the morning by beating on our doors with a hammer. <laughs> and if you weren't there on time, you had to do bear crawls and on all fours up and down the field till you threw up, and then you had to run through your your vomit. Uh, it was just it was tougher than than Don Reed, and maybe that was part of that 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 turnaround we're talking about, uh, Kurt, that happened in, in, in 77 with, with uh, Rich Brooks. It took him a few years to get that whole program in place, but he brought in uh, Willie Blasher, probably one of the greatest linebackers at Oregon out of uh, Contra Costa Junior College. It was considered a coup, mm -hmm. a five-star for his time. But it was fun having uh, you know somebody as, as, as a great character and a great coach as Steve Greatwood to, to be able to talk to all these years. Right. Yeah. He was a teammate, and now he's, you know, in the belly of the beast at the University of Oregon program. He was a 220-pound freshman my senior year. We pushed him around like he was on roller skates. <laughs> he, was, he was in awe. And sure enough, you know, here he was starting uh, and, and playing. So, yeah, he's a, he's a, but he did a lot of conditioning. But it's so nice. So I guess what I was saying is, is these coaches at Oregon are, are very down to earth. You know, you can sit down with Mike Bellotti. You can sit down with Steve Greatwood, and, then, and they'll talk to you like we're talking right here. Right. There's, there's no ego involved in those folks, and, and, and that to me is something very important. Uh, the whole thing has just been such a wonderful ride for those of us that played 30, 40 years ago to see Rose Bowl, National Championship, Rose Bowl victory, and, and you know, it, it's just something like it's out of a novel. How can this be? But, but you're right. I, I think deep in our hearts we know, because we, we've been involved in this program all this time, we know why. We, we know why they're they're as good as they are, and, and that's because they do the evaluations and they get the players and they they work them to death. You know, mm -hmm. people look at Dan Fouts and then they skip forward and they kind of forget that these years even happened. But while there's a lot of turnover, there wasn't a lot of wins. There was the building of the foundation that the program w was built upon. Why should fans remember your era of Oregon Duck football? What I want people to remember is is that yeah, we we, we didn't give people that much fun stuff. <laughs> but the ones that stuck with the program and, and the ones that, that were Duck fans, those are the people that, that are the true uh, the, the true winners out there that I think of. I think of, of, of the families that supported us and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the fans. And, and that to me is, is, is my takeaway from that period is there have been fans of this program that are doing this for 40, 50 years plus. So they didn't go. Those 12,000 people those people should all be given free seats to Odson today when it's packed with 65,000 people, in my opinion, because they stuck with us. They watched and believed in the Ducks. And, of course, we beat the Beavers every year after that. I think that 73, after that, I think we were 28-2 and two against the Beavers. Mm -hmm. That's what I think I'd like people to remember as well, is that we beat the Beavers every year. And and that to me, that's the, one of the greatest rivalries in the country. It's the oldest rivalry west of the Mississippi. I think it's 128 years old now. And... and You've never seen anything stranger than a bunch of middle-aged white guys yelling and screaming at each other before the game uh, up there in Oregon. It's different than it is at USC, UCLA, or, or uh, Utah, BYU. Well, maybe Utah, BYU, you get a lot of the same thing. but uh, uh, Not as much people. swearing, though. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of that rivalry and, and part of what, you know, people don't realize. People are, are football crazy in Oregon. They, they love the sport and... and and they hate Washington, and you know we all do because of, of, of that rivalry there. And, and and I guess that's what I would just want to have people remember about that that era was that you know those those traditions stayed through that era and, and maybe even became bigger and, mm. and more important. Excellent. Well, Keith Gunther, thank you so much for joining us this week on the Fish Duck One on One. Thank you, Kurt.